We are so excited today to welcome Jennifer Archibald to our second round of Global Conversations. This is where we talk about the skills and the challenges of being an artistic director, executive director, CEO during the time of pandemic and a lot of other uh, society issues going on in the United States. So Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Thank you for having me. So let's, let's start off talking a little bit about the five different places you are, the projects you're working on, uh, what's, what, how you prioritize all this, what's exciting you during this time. It's a difficult time because when COVID started, I had lost many commissions and you know, many opportunities. I think when I choreograph, that's definitely the reason why I wake up every morning and it became super clear when I didn't have any rehearsal scheduled. It's great to have a job, to have a gig, but yeah. you start to really realize that choreographing and being in the studio and interacting with dancers is why you do it. In reality, I realized that I think all of us were in the same boat. I decided to reach out to dancers all over the world. So I was, and these are dancers who I had never even met before. So I would um, try to contact dancers in Africa and in uh, Australia and Japan and um, the Netherlands and ask them if they were willing to give me some Zoom time. And they, they said yes. And that is kind of what pulled me out of the darkness of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was able to um, start connecting physically and emotionally with another dancer, another artist. And what was really interesting about the process was that at the end of each rehearsal, whether I knew the dancer or not, they would say, you know what, I really needed this. But it was nice to um, be able to lift each other up in that sense. It almost sounds like a symbiotic relationship. Um, Absolutely. Like an organism and that every every part needs the other part to survive and you know you need the dancers they need you they want to move and through the act of creation you feel like you're coming alive again yes yeah i mean that's ideally i mean you you feel that when you when you walk into a dance institution where you're just choreographing when you're doing residencies or when you're doing commissions with ballet companies but to um, be able to do it through zoom because there's always a clear physical disconnect because you're you're doing it through a computer you're like giving out movement through through a computer screen but definitely um, there is definitely a sense of satisfaction of it um, but then there's also the idea of if a dancer has never worked with you before how are they really transmitting the movement that you're giving them and that was also, it's also a learning process because how you deliver movement live versus virtually is definitely a different experience on both ends. Yeah, I mean, you can't put your hands on somebody and say more That's like right. this. And, and that dancer, unless they're in a quarantine pod, is not in relation to another dancer. So you can't grab people and pull them That's together right. and pull them apart and this arm goes here. So that's Actually, in some ways, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about it, that may create some new um, directorial choreographic chops. You may have had to learn new languaging. Right, absolutely. I think it was, it, it became a learning process on so many levels. Um, I, I work at Yale School of Drama. It had asked me if um, I could choreograph a play with 16 actors on Zoom and how this was going to look, what, what this was going to look like. And then um, I'm supposed to do a, a residency for University of Michigan. And they had asked me, you know, if these students are not going back on campus, how can we create a residency with an artist and have these dancers really embody movement? Um, I went to law school there. I understand they have a great, a great dance department. Um, so tell us a little bit about that residency and other residencies. How do you decide if it's gonna be a good fit? How do you decide how much work you can accept? I tried to do about three to four um, unit college residencies a year, and I try to fit them in around my ballet commissions. Um, teaching is really important to me. I've always um, felt like I should be a choreographer that you know works professionally, but still teaches the, the next generation of dancers. The, the University of Michigan, or Western Michigan, I'm sorry, they okay. had asked me to do this, this residency back in, January and they wanted me to do like a contemporary work for them 
And um, I had said that maybe we should, because we are doing it virtually, normally you would have the entire dance department audition for you live. And then I thought, well, we can, we have to make it an educational tool. So let's coach these dancers on how to create an audition reel. I think any sort of professional dance experience that we can give them, it's important. It's, um, it sounds like you're actually teaching real life important skills too, which is what your audition tape should look like. Uh, when you, you were referring to the Essential Dance Artist Project, um, yeah. I was wondering, um, how'd you pick the artists and are you still in touch with some of them? I mean, has it created kind of a little global community, people that you can reach out to? Might, might oh yeah, definitely. Um, initially, I just was going to do every single state in the US. And then I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I should be reaching out to dancers who I don't know. So when a, a dancer from Johannesburg, Africa responds to a message on Instagram, there's like, you feel a little success. <laughs> and, sure. then, and then when they set up rehearsal with you and you see them live and you realize that they're dancing in Africa and you're having this rehearsal in Brooklyn, and that's kind of the celebration of what Dance Essential Artist is. For me, um, I found, you know, you have phase one, phase two, phase three that are opening in COVID. And I always felt like they were always just at the, always at the bottom of the barrel. Yep. And I felt that especially when I was working commercially, even simply naming it essential dance artists was important because I think people need to realize that dancers are important in our community. Yeah, and I, um, you always hear about dance being a universal language and global, but you don't see it very much. Perhaps this might be a small upside to the pandemic. And it's yeah. definitely, it's definitely a, a really fun idea are you posting these? How um, is, are you just continuing to make work on different people? Well, I've, yeah, I've done about 40 different solos. Initially, I was just going to post them on Instagram, but now I'm starting to, you know, brainstorm on a, on a greater scale just to see what could happen and what I could do with all that work. So you're, this is very much sort of bringing the world together and, you know, you're an artist in residence, you're a teacher, you're creating, you're helping these young artists create um, audition tapes. I mean, this is all fostering, nurturing, creating connections. But there is, at a certain point, you have to be the boss. And whether you're running a company or being a choreographer, and I want to talk a little bit about the skills required to communicate what you want, and also, in some cases, to deliver some not so great news. Um, now, if you're not, you know, in a, in a big company with a tiered system, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's less likely you're going to have to fire somebody, quote unquote, but talk a little bit about that, being, being the boss. I think living in New York City, a lot of doors close and open, and you kind of get used to these, the, this roller coaster of things happening and things getting taken right from underneath you. I try to put everything out on the table with my dancers and keep a really, really honest and transparent relationship with everyone I work with. And I think that allows me to keep strong dancers working with me and just, I think being transparent is important. I think traditionally dance can, have, can be very superficial. And I think it's, I, for me, I just wanna make sure that everyone knows where I stand and 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 then we can work yep and that's that's very honest and it's certainly if if people's feelings are hurt at the beginning it's it's there's nothing worse you know i mean i haven't danced in years but any any athletic endeavor or artistic endeavor um it, it just not getting a read is the worst thing of all how do you decide because to some extent now you do have in some ways your pick how do you decide companies you want to work with i mean I know that you've worked with a number of companies headed by women, uh, but is it the dancers? Is it the kind of work that has come out in the past? Versatility is extremely important to me because it has to reflect the aesthetics that I, that, that I choreograph. But also having, you know, when you have an intimate conversation with a director who is open to my ideas and doesn't really put me into um, like a structured box of how they want me to choreograph or what they want me to present that definitely will make me lean towards that, that job. How do you, um, this is a slight shift, but not a huge one. 
how, what, what training and experiences do you think have been most useful um, running your own company? So again, we're imagining, I'm hoping, the next generation of young women um, who want to come up, who are thinking about maybe never before they see your interview um, and it's like, well, maybe I can run my own company. Why to do that? What skills are necessary? What the benefits are? Women today have to wear many hats. And, you know, I, I have been um, sound engineering my own music and video editing my own work and understanding um, how to market my, my material because I was really interested in storytelling through movement. I've never thought that, you know, I've got it. So now I can sit back. And I think having constant drive is a reflection of a successful businesswoman. And for me, I just have kept my eyes open and try to be as insightful and aware of my surroundings as possible. Can you ever see yourself settling in one place, running one company, or do you like being a little bit more vag vagabondy, a little bit, do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this? I like being, I like being all over. I do. Okay. Yeah. It keeps it, it keeps it interesting and it also is important to me to meet new people all the time. So, you know, taking um, a full-time academic faculty position is something that just, I, I didn't want to do only because I just felt like it would just keep me in one place. Yeah. And creatively, I want to, to see, I want to travel and I want to meet new people. All right, we're going to do the fun one here and then we'll go okay. back to the, a couple of the last serious questions. So lightning round. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Um, favorite dance memory? I met Judith Jameson in Toronto in a hotel that I had waited backstage to meet her for about eight hours when I was 14 for her to sign her um, autobiography book. And, and everything um, you wanted it to be? Everything I wanted it to be. She took me in a in a limo and brought me back to the theater and gave me tickets to see the show. And I was able to sit in rehearsal to see Shelter, which was, you know, one of the most amazing all female pieces. And I sat next to her as she, as she watched, as we watched a dress rehearsal before the show. Holy moly. Yeah. That, I mean, that's extraordinary. And how generous and how encompassing and wonderful but to sit right next to her. That's a pretty good one. That may be the best I've ever heard. Um, favorite, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to top that. Favorite ballet? Anything that Alexander Ekman does makes I, me happy. One of my favorites. Oh yes. my, he's so funny. Yes, brilliant and funny and just brings, just theatrically, it's beautiful to see. Sweet or savory? Sweet. Any, and I'll drop right to guilty pleasure. Oh, I would say cupcakes. Broadway or West End? Broadway. Okay. Dream travel destination post COVID? I, Brazil. How can you say that? Uh, have you been before? I've been before, but I haven't been for a long time because I was working in the mid, the middle area. Um, of, of, Brazil, of Brazil. So I, I really would like to just stay there longer. Tutu or no tutu? And depends on when, I guess. No tutu. Okay. Uh, favorite theater? The Paris Opera House. That has been a fairly popular choice, by the way. Choose a scene, rubies, emeralds, or diamonds? Rubies. Also, also a really popular choice. Beach or mountain, or you can imagine beach. both, I it's guess. It's always beach. Is it beach? Yes. Graham or Cunningham? Graham. The emotion that comes from the core cannot be questioned. Are you a rehearsal or a performance gal? I like performance. Okay. So let's do the big thing, the big questions. What would you like to see changed in the art form? More diversity. Just more diversity in the storytelling. Yes. I think there's many stories to be told. And I think it's um, not as simple as putting a, a person of color within the, the ensemble of Swan Lake or putting a person of color 
as the lead of Cinderella, I think the stories that we actually are presenting to the audiences can be, um, can be different. I could not agree more. Um, there's so, you know, we, we come at it, DDP comes at it from the gender perspective, um, which yes. is, you know, with intersectionality, you still get that. But it's the same stories over and over and over again. It gets kind of dull. No wonder, no wonder people like, what am I seeing up on the stage that relates to my life? And just simply missing so many wonderful stories out there that could be told. Um, I hear a lot of my Romeo and Juliet, my Swan Lake, mm -hmm. my Giselle, et cetera. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I wonder about that. Um, I was listening into a panel for on Court of Ballet and talking about understanding the, the history of ballet, but also how Ashley Bowder was talking about how, you know, you're hermetically sealed in a company at age 16 and you get shot out at the end of the career. And unless you make a deliberate effort the way you have to go to galleries to see other art forms, um, you may not know other stories. The artistic directors of these dance companies also need to be brave enough to take a chance in the stories that they're presenting. They may be scared of losing funders and losing support if they do decide to take risk. And for me, I think there's slowly um, a change that I'm witnessing in regards to how they want their ballets produced. I've had artistic directors tell me, I think my audience members or my patrons are ready to see something else. And that's great to hear considering um, you kind of see the same season planning year after year. There's a formula to it. So if we can change the formula um, and we can be optimistic, it's very possible that we can start changing the way we look at ballet. Yeah, I am. Um, ballet for supposedly creative industry is one of the least creative, timidly iterative art forms, industries I've ever seen. So knowing that Dance Data Project, very, very small organization, is there anything you think um, we can do in specific or should be doing outside of our numbers and the advocacy to help foster a more diverse and frankly, a more interesting and better art form. There's a lot of things that you were teaching me about, about the inequalities of, of women in, in, the, in the ballet dance industry. You're, you're getting super specific. Um, what, I, what I will say is that I, I think it's important for young dancers to see that they, the, I just feel like young dancers need to see someone that looks like them in front of the room. Show these images and not only reveal facts that um, that, that can be inspiring. Yeah, I mean, Gina Davis's motto, Jiva Danison Institute is, um, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. And I, I think I underestimated Jennifer when I started this a few years ago, how important the visual is, just literally the image of women at the front of the room raising yes. their hands to command the room. Yes. I think I, I frankly had just not realized how important that would be until I started looking through you know, issue after issue after issue of whatever dance magazine or website or whatever you want to mention. So that's, that's a great point. That's the first time we've heard that. We've been thinking about it. Um, that's part of global conversations, but I think that's a great idea. So last question, what makes you hopeful? And do you have a dream commission in the back of your mind, like a big, whether it's big, small, full length, et cetera, that you would just love to do. And you don't even have to tell us what it is if you don't want. I've always loved film. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I've always wanted to do a documentary on stage through movement. So, so to kind of, I, I, think the, I think we've got millennials who probably don't come to see ballet as often as we would like them to. I think we can increase the ballet audience and because they are so in tune with reality shows and documentaries 
And that's what's interesting to them because they want to be connected to these political issues. I think having a, um, having a doc documentary formatted work would be a new story to tell. I think it's brilliant. That's so cool. <laughs> it's interesting, like when you watch ballets, it's such this, it, it's such a beautiful, it's a beautiful image on stage. You see all these people dancing in unison, but you don't, do we really connect with who is on stage? What do we know about these dancers? And um, if you're coming out every single season doing the same work, we never really know who these people are. And I think the story behind that artistry can be extremely important. Yeah, and it would be really fun to do it with a new work that nobody's seen before from the choreographer walking in the room and meeting the dancers for the first time or even selecting the dancers all the way through to the, to the opening right. or something like that. That'd be really cool. Okay. Thank you very, very much to Jennifer Archibald, uh, who has somehow managed to be in five places at the same time, bend the time-space continuum on an ongoing basis in a way I've never seen before. Um, thank you so much for your, your wisdom.